So, um, to remain within the realms of uh, anthropology and ethnography, I would like to invite uh, Tom Rice to the stage, who's a lecturer in anthropology in the University of Exeter in the UK, and who is the recent author of a book called Hearing and the Hospital, Sound, Listening, Knowledge and Experience. Uh, Tom Rice has also made uh, some BBC radio documentaries, such as The Art of Water Music, and um, uh, he'll, he'll be telling us about uh, not only the way that doctors hear, but the ways that uh, bodies talk. And I think uh, it's essential in kind of understanding the kind of contemporary forms of listening. So thanks very much, Tom. Welcome. No, that's not what I wanted to happen. Can you switch it back to the computer? Uh, yeah. Ah, that's great. Great. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Tom Rice. I'm a lecturer in anthropology at the University of Exeter. Can everyone hear me okay? Sure. Uh, you want it louder? Okay. Can you? Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. So I'm going to talk like this. That's great. Like For me, that's much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe I could just hold it in my hand. That's also fine. Yeah? Okay. Great. Okay. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, listening to the corporeal voice, uh, the voice of the body. And uh, just... Uh, by way of introducing the presentation of myself, I'm going to explain a bit about my background. So I've always really loved radio, and I do bits of radio, uh, as, uh, as was just mentioned by uh, Lawrence there. Um, a couple of years ago, I made this program for the Radio 4, uh, the UK's kind of major talk radio station, uh, about the relationship between music and water. So it started off by talking about how classical composers had tried to evoke water in musical figures and patterns. And then it looked at how um, in the 60s and 70s, experimental uh, musicians used uh, water, particularly drips, to make music, um, experimental music then. And then it looked a bit about uh, people who uh, don't draw a distinction between the sound of flowing water and music, and so make long recordings of rivers and so on uh, to try to express the kind of musicality of flowing water. And then in the end, it looked at um, how uh, musicians working now are using water samples to create dance music. So it just traces this kind of trajectory through time of different ways in which music, uh, water has influenced music. But when I was an undergraduate, I was really wanted to work in radio. And I, I did radio all the time. I did student radio. I did community radio. And I also did hospital radio. I worked in uh, this... Uh, hospital radio station in the biggest hospital in Edinburgh in Scotland called Red Dot Radio. And my job was to go around and talk to patients and find out what they wanted to listen to, what they wanted to hear more of, to get requests and that kind of thing. And I did that every day for about three months. And what became really noticeable was that the main reason that the patients liked the radio and they listened to it a lot was that it gave them an opportunity to escape the other sounds on the ward. So if you just imagine what that might be like, the kind of the swish made by privacy curtains as they're drawn around a bed, uh, rattling wheels on medicine trolleys, um, coughing, uh, people kind of moving around and moving in their beds. This whole kind of uh, soundscape to them was very disturbing and intrusive, and it prevented them from sleeping well, and it woke them early, and they very much wanted to escape. They weren't as used to managing their sound environment using headphones as we are today. They were mainly elderly people, and this was 
before the iPod, in the kind of pre-iPod era. So I was really surprised by how strongly the patients felt about this soundscape. And I ended up writing this study, uh, undergraduate study, um, called uh, Sound Selves, an Acoustomology of Sound and Self in the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, which is published in this anthropology journal. And uh, you can probably see from the cover art the idea that I'm trying to convey there, um, this of the patient being very much uh, exposed to sound. Um, and sound being a very important part of the illness experience. So this might not seem to be particularly anthropological. Um, it isn't really an ex uh, about an investigation of kind of cultural diversity in any way. But I did draw quite heavily on two uh, studies that have been done on uh, people living in Papua New Guinea. Um, Papua New Guinea is the country in kind of red above Australia there. And these people are writing about uh, communities in the very interior of Papua New Guinea that live in landscape a little like this, very uh, heavily rainforested and very steep. And obviously this rainforest is full of sounds. It's full of birdsong, cicadas, uh, frogs, that kind of thing. And the anthropologists who work in this area have said how important sound is to the people living there. So that, for example, in one group, they feel that the sounds, the songs made by birds are the voices of ancestors speaking to them. Um, they also uh, use the uh, melodies made by bird songs in their music. So they uh, use bird songs as the basis of their musical patterns. And also, just in a practical way, if you're hunting in this kind of environment, you can't see animals until they're very close. So you have to track them through the forest using your hearing. And in a similar way, this landscape, it, it's very wet as well as very steep. So there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, streams rip, uh, crossing this landscape and falling down in waterfalls and so on. And so the way one of these groups navigate is through water presences. So you keep one falling water pattern on your left, another one on your right, and you move towards a third one. And you keep one behind you so that they're always navigating in relation to these different sounds that are coming through the forest. So. These studies say that sound plays this very important role for these groups. And they also say that we tend not to have such a strong acoustic engagement with place in the West. And I was basically using this article to argue that, well, this is one kind of uh, site in which hearing is extremely important and becomes a very uh, important part of the whole illness experience. And really just to say that uh, I was, well, I was just really trying to draw in uh, the ideas from these Papua New Guinea studies into this analysis of a very different context, the Western modern hospital. But a little while after I finished this study, I, uh, I got a chest infection. And I, uh, I went to the doctor, and he listened to my heart with a stethoscope. It's a very common interaction. happens thousands of times a day. And I remember thinking that he seemed to be taking a long time over it. And then he said, ah, yes, you most definitely have a heart murmur. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what a heart murmur is. It's all right, don't worry, it's not too serious. I, uh, I hope to live at least till the end of the presentation. <laughs> so this is a normal heart, a diagram of a normal heart. This is the, the heart murmur term he used here. You can see there are four valves, tricuspid, pulmonary, aortic, mitral. Now, normally when blood flows through a heart valve, the valve is opening and closing nicely like this. But sometimes something affects the valve and it doesn't work like that. So it either becomes stiff and just goes like this, or it becomes floppy and it goes like this. And obviously when it's going like this, the blood's moving through very cleanly. But if it goes like this, then the blood has to be pushed through. And that creates turbulence in the blood flow. And that, blood, that turbulence produces a sound which the doctor can hear as a murmur through the stethoscope. Similarly, if you have the floppy valve, then the blood goes through, but it doesn't close properly, so a little bit flows back. And that creates a different sound uh, at a different stage in the heart cycle. And again, the doctor can hear that. So I'm just going to try to play you uh, some examples of some heart murmurs using a CD that's designed to teach medical students to hear these kinds of murmurs. 
the first one I'm, track I'm going to play is just a, a normal heart sound. Then the second one is uh, mitral regurgitation. So that's the mitral valve and floppy mitral valve so that the blood is coming back through it. And the next one is aortic stenosis. So that's the aortic valve, and that's when it's stiff, and the blood has to be pushed through. The first one is quite a mild example. The second one, the valve is very stiff, and you really the blood really is pushing through, and that creates a very loud, distinctive sound. So I hope I'll just be able to play you that now. You will now hear a recording of the normal heartbeat. The first heart sound is caused by mitral and tricuspid valve closure and is sharper in quality than the second sound, which represents aortic and then pulmonary closure. We will now turn to pathological conditions where diseased valves cause murmurs because of increased turbulence. There may also be changes in the quality of the two heart sounds or extra clicks or sounds. You will now hear the heart sounds and murmurs of a patient with moderate, non-rheumatic mitral regurgitation. The first heart sound is soft and is immediately followed by a loud, harsh systolic murmur. The murmur extends all the way to the second heart sound, maintaining a constant volume. The second heart sound is normal and there are no added sounds. you will hear the heart sounds of a patient with moderate aortic stenosis. Note the loud crescendo-decrescendo systolic murmur, which is followed by a soft but clearly audible aortic closure. You will now hear the murmur of severe calcific aortic stenosis. The murmur is again of the crescendo-decrescendo type and is loud, long, almost squeaky in quality. In some cases it can take on a musical quality, being described as a seagull murmur. So, so there we are. Um, obviously, that's being played on a huge system here. Um, and they're also very kind of uh, quite clear examples of murmurs. It's a bit difficult where you're kind of squinting with your ear down these tubes in a noisy room uh, at a patient who's maybe, I don't know, got all kinds of other sounds going on in their body. Um, it's a very, very difficult skill. It's known to be a very hard thing to do to detect particularly subtle murmurs um, uh, in the medical profession. It's considered a real art form. So it turned out I had this murmur, and I was horrified to learn about it, of course, but I was also quite intrigued by the way that the doctor had heard it and been able to interpret this sound uh, from within me. And I felt as though there was this voice that had kind of spoken on my behalf telling the doctors something about me that I didn't actually know myself. Uh, I felt the, that the murmur was giving away secrets about me. I, I felt it was betraying me, because I like to think of myself as quite a healthy guy, and it was basically whispering to the doctor that, uh, actually, there's something wrong with this guy, like that. And it was very much speaking without my permission, and I had no control over it. It was an involuntary uh, voice. But this interaction with the doctor also made me realize something else, which is that in this study, I'd looked at the, very much at the patient perspective, but I also realized that in hospitals, doctors are also listening to soundscapes. They're listening to soundscapes inside the body. 
and they are applying their own sets of sonic knowledges to the body. Equally, you could say that nurses too uh, use forms of listening in their work. Uh, when I spoke to nurses later, they'd tell me that th they're often kind of visually preoccupied with a task, but they're always listening out to the ward to hear what's going on, to hear if there are any problems emerging, if any patients need help, if any equipment is uh, malfunctioning. So I started to realize that uh, I wanted to do a bigger study about sonic knowledge in the hospital setting. And I ended up uh, focusing very much on doctors listening uh, with the stethoscope um, and doing a big study in this hospital in uh, central London. It's called St. Thomas. You can see it's in very central London because it's right on the River Thames. It's, uh, if you look out of the window, you see the Houses of Parliament here. And this is the London Eye. And that's the hospital there on the right. So I decided to focus on a, heart, a cardiology unit, a, a heart unit. And the reason I did that was because it's a space where I knew that doctors would be doing stethoscopic listening a lot because stethoscopic listening is very important in chest medicine and in heart medicine. It's also a space where there are lots of technologies that also produce sounds. So you might think of a heart monitor going beep, 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 beep all the time. Um, but I'll just play you another kind of interesting uh, little sound in a moment. But it comes from another technology that was being used in this environment a lot. Um, echocardiography, or cardiac ultrasound. It's used the use of ultrasound to create images of, of the heart. But again, what's interesting here is that it's sound that's being used to create a visual image. In the same way that the doctor is listening in order to get a sense of what's happening inside the heart, there's a sense here again of acoustic illumination, that sound is shedding light, showing you what's going on inside the uh, body. So I'll just play you a quick sound file, which just is the sound of that cardiac device. So it's just a very, very simple kind of recording, but I just wanted to show you just again, kind of something that contributes to that interesting sonic atmosphere and tells you something about the kind of different sonic skills that are being used in this setting. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think I see very much kind of uh, cardiac ultrasound as being an extension of stethoscopic listening in a different direction. Uh, obviously it's mainly visual, but those sounds that you heard are useful to the person who's doing this uh, scan because those whooshing sounds tell you whether the blood is moving to, towards or away from uh, the device in the hand, the, the transducer, as it's called. So actually the sounds are very useful in interpreting the images. So it's just another sonic skill that was going on in that hospital setting. And I also continued to look at patient responses to the hospital sounds. And I also looked at nurses and their way in which they manage um, the ward using listening. So I worked at St. Thomas's Hospital for a whole year doing this study. And it was some time ago. And finally, after 10 years of work or so, I've managed to produce this book, uh, Hearing in the Hospital, Sound, Listening, Knowledge and Experience, which uh, I'd love you to take a look at if you uh, were interested in doing that. But what does all this have to do with the voice? Well, I've already talked about my own heart murmuring. Um, and I'd like to talk more about links between the stethoscope, stethoscopic listening, and the voice uh, over the next uh, part of the presentation. But I think what's interesting uh, about um, this voice is that it completely bypasses the intellectual, and cognitive, and emotional, and intentional parts of the brain. It's a body that. It's a voice that speaks uh, 
without any of that kind of input. And I think it's a voice that perhaps only speaks to certain people, or at least it only speaks to certain people clearly. Because, as I've suggested already, learning to listen and interpret these sounds uh, of the body and of the heart is a very difficult skill. It takes a lot of practice. And so we probably don't listen to our own bodies that carefully uh, very much. Um, it takes this particular specialist auditory knowledge to be able to interpret it. But I also want to suggest that, as I kind of hinted earlier, it's very much a voice that speaks without our permission. It's an involuntary voice. It speaks in spite of us, and sometimes instead of us, I'm going to suggest uh, in what's to come in the next few minutes. So let me tell you a story about the stethoscope. It's about the invention of the stethoscope specifically. In the previous slide, those were all modern stethoscopes, but the first stethoscope looked like this. It was a kind of simple wooden cylinder. And it was invented by this man, uh, René Theophile Hyacinth Lanec, in uh, 1816. And the, the story of the invention goes that one day he was walking through the uh, Tuileries in Paris, and um, the case of one of his patients was uh, playing on his mind. Because this woman was suffering from a heart condition, and the trouble was that he hadn't been able to gain anything uh, from the accounts of the illness that she gave. He hadn't been able to learn anything from her actual voice, from her own voice. Her speech was really quite unhelpful. And this is really important because at this time, in early 19th century medicine, Doctors depended on patients' voices and patients' narratives to give themselves clues as to what was going on inside the body. So the fact that she wasn't giving him any useful information was a real problem. There were also other problems. Uh, this woman was quite considerably overweight, and uh, that meant that he couldn't do what he might normally have done, which was to listen just by pressing his ear against the patient's body, which was what doctors did before the stethoscope was invented. But it wasn't very useful, particularly useful anyway, because you couldn't listen with very much precision, and you could never be sure that what you were hearing wasn't produced by the friction between your ear and, um, and the patient's body. And Lanek had other objections too. Uh, this was Paris early 19th century, patients were coming to his clinic uh, in a not very well washed, you know, covered in sweat, and he objected to having to press his ear to their bodies in this way. And he also felt, I'll just show you this slide quickly, this technique of pressing your ear to a, somebody's body is called immediate auscultation. Uh, I believe the phrase auscultation comes from the Greek auscultar, to, uh, to, to listen. But this is a, a picture of a blind doctor who's uh, using this technique to listen to the lungs of a, a baby here. But Lenek felt that it was a little bit too sexy and a little bit indecent to uh, press his ear to the body of a young lady like this. Uh, this isn't Lenek, this is a, an, an older doctor. Um, but I think this image quite accurately conveys uh, Lenek's uh, basic objection to the technique. So while he was wondering what to do, uh, and he was walking through these, uh, the gardens up here on the right, um, he uh, saw some children playing with uh, a, a plank of wood, uh, a log, and some were tapping at one end and scratching at one end, and some children were pressing their ears to the wood and listening at the other end. And the story goes that this reminded Lenek that sounds could travel through uh, solid bodies. And he went back to the, um, his patient, this was his eureka moment, he went back to his patient, he rolled up some papers into a, a tube, like this, and he pressed it to the patient's chest, and he found that he could hear her heartbeat much more clearly than he would have been able to do with uh, immediate auscultation. Um, that story is actually a bit of a myth, it's the kind of thing that medical doc uh, doctors tell their students as a kind of way of interesting them. 
But actually, Lynette doesn't say that that's what happened in his own writing. He says that he was sitting by the bedside of this patient and he was reminded, he doesn't say by what, of this fact that sound could travel through uh, pieces of wood. And so he rolled up a piece of paper to resemble a log and he pressed it to his ch chest and she, he found that he could hear things very well. So after that experience, Lenek spent several years making stethoscopes. Um, Lenek was an, a good musician and a, a flute player and he kind of is thought to have modeled the stethoscope on the early design, on, on a basic flute. And he had a, a lathe, a machine in his house where he made his own stethoscopes. And he also spent a long time developing the technique of stethoscopic listening, of how you listen to a, a patient and what sounds that you might hear actually mean. So Lenek was working at this time when there was a very profound change taking place in medicine. It was uh, known now as the anatomical turn. And basically, doctors wanted to see inside the body. And they were completely obsessed by opening up the body to look inside, using anatomy and dissection to do that. And actually, Lenek was part of this enthusiasm for anatomy. So what he would do is when patients came into his clinic, they were usually suffering from tuberculosis. And uh, he would listen to their chests and wrote down carefully what he heard. Once the patient died, which they almost invariably did, he would cut that patient open and note down what was happening inside the lungs. And so after doing this for lots of patients, he worked out quite a good system of how sounds corresponded to changes inside the body itself. And that eventually meant that he could listen to a patient who was still alive and work out with a good level of certainty what was happening inside the body. So that was a major breakthrough because it meant he could do an anatomization of living patients, which was something that wasn't possible beforehand. So his technique really made that possible. So what does this have to do with the voice again? Well, as I said before, prior to this kind of uh, anatomical turn, doctors really depended on their patients to tell them what was wrong. And the doctor would then form a diagnosis from what he'd learned and understood. But doctors like Lenek wanted to be able to trust their own senses and make their own judgments independently of what the patient said. Reason for that, which is that patients just couldn't be trusted. You know, they often exaggerated minor symptoms. They, uh, uh, they of often played down major symptoms. And often they lied, and they just didn't tell the truth. So the reason that uh, Lenek liked this technique so much was that these sounds from the patients were voices that didn't lie and that couldn't deceive. So you see this interesting change taking place. If you imagine the patient voice on one fader and the uh, body voice, the sounds of the body on another fader, then following Lenek, the patient voice is faded down and the body voice is kind of faded up. And the body sounds come to the center of the auditory attention uh, and the patient voice uh, recedes. And in fact, if you look at a modern uh, stethoscopic interaction, you see that actually the stethoscope bypasses the voice of the patient altogether. That, you know, you're listening in your own auditory sphere and not paying attention to what the patient is actually saying necessarily. And I found in the interactions that I watched, that actually doctors would use stethoscopic listening as a way of shutting up patients. You know, uh, the patient's talking about their symptoms, you know, oh, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. And they get at the stethoscope and say, right, I'm gonna ha I'll have a little listen. And it's just a way, you know, it shows it's time to be quiet now, the stethoscope says. It's time for me to listen uh, to your body and, you know, time for you to be quiet and for me to concentrate. So that was very much used in that way. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about one particular sound or type of sound that Lenek discovered in his early use of the stethoscope. And that is this uh, word, uh, a pectriloquy. 
Um, it comes from the Latin uh, for the chest or the breast, uh, pectoris, and uh, this word loki means to speak. Actually, it's interesting, there's an interesting parallel with ventriloquy. I don't know what the word is in Dutch, but um, uh, it's this art form of uh, a person speaking and pretending that a puppet is speaking. So they speak with their mouth closed and it operate the puppet and it looks as though the puppet's speaking. But the word for that in English is ventriloquy. And that comes from the Latin for to speak from the stomach. So the venter, belly, and loki, speak. So you have this idea of a different kind of bodily speech there. But sticking with petriloquy, what is a, a petriloquy? Well, Lenek noticed that if he listened to patients' chests while they spoke, sometimes he'd be going over the chest, and there'd be a particular place, um, and the place varied, where uh, the voice sounded directly in his ear, very loudly, uh, a kind of extremely resonant voice in his ear. And it's quite a well-known phenomenon in modern medicine, but basically, if you look at uh, these different tuberculous lungs, uh, the one in the middle, you'll see it has a cavity in it. And what Lenek realized after he'd done all his dissections was that this petroliquy, this very loud voice in the ears, occurred where there were these cavities in the lungs, uh, over the place where there was a cavity. And so he worked out that petroliquies speak directly through these uh, holes, which are often filled with dead white blood cells and, and pus. So that it seems that this uh, liquid is conveying the sounds very directly to the edge of the chest and into the doctor's ears. And actually, petroliquy is still a really well-known uh, medical phenomenon, still used a lot. But now there are, are three types. And it occurs in places, uh, well, there are three types. I'll introduce the three types. Uh, bronchophony which you test by listening and while the patient's speaking certain words. Often it's 99, traditionally it's 99 because it creates a reverberance in the chest. But also toy boat, scooby-doo, blue balloons. These words also kind of make the chest resonate. And so they're good for creating a petriloquy. And all that's happening really is that the sound is being conducted very efficiently by fluid in the lung or by a solid thing in the lung like a, maybe fungus or maybe tumor and that that's going to the edge of the chest and is sounding very loudly in the doctor's ears. So the other one I wanted to mention is a uh, whispered triloquy, which is exactly the same as uh, bronchophony, except that it's tested by making the patient whisper. Uh, and they whisper these same words, 99, toy boat, scooby-doo, blue balloons. Um, and um, yeah. Um, the reason that it uh, comes across, uh, you would try the whispering rather than the speaking, is uh, in case uh, there's potential confusion with the sounds of the breath. Um, if you think you hear it the first time with bronchophony, you try it again with the whispered version. But there's also this third type, which is really interesting. It's called uh, egophony. And uh, it actually comes from the Greek word for a, a goat. So uh, it means uh, the voice of a goat. And uh, in this instance, you test it by listening to the chest while the patient says, e, like that, or e. And what happens is that the, uh, the sound here, um, the liquid or the solid here, is thought to uh, in interfere with the high frequencies in that e sound. And so that actually, if there is fluid present, you hear it as A, but you hear it again very loudly in the, in the uh, ears. So I'm just going to try and play you an example of that. That's the E sound. Now you will hear the letter E spoken over the area of consolidation. Now you will hear the sounds as the microphone is moved from one side to the other, starting with the healthy side. 
So you can see it's quite a subtle difference, but as you move from one side to the other, the quality of the voice changes. So I think that's really interesting the way that here the voice becomes something that you listen to diagnostically, uh, as in it might reveal something that's wrong, and that uh, it's no longer the verbal content of the voice that's important, it's the quality, the sonic quality of the voice that becomes interesting. So just to conclude, I want to talk a little bit about this theme that voice is a creature of transition. How do my reflections on the stethoscope speak to that theme? Well, I suppose the most important point that I have is the one that I mentioned whereby the voice, uh, there was a transition in the voice around this kind of uh, time of the anatomical turn in medicine whereby there was a transition from the patient's spoken voice being the most important to the voice of the body being the most important. So after the invention of the stethoscope, the patient voice kind of recedes in importance and the body sounds become the focus of attention. But I think that it's also interesting that stethoscopic listening clarifies that idea that all of us have multiple bodies and that uh, multiple voices, I'm sorry, that the body, uh, all of us don't have multiple bodies. Uh, at least I'm not aware of that. Um, so there are these multiple body, multiple voices. I'm sorry, I made the same mistake. Um, I think there's a voice inside me that really wants to say that. But anyway, the, the body sounds provide just another one of these voices that we possess. I also think it's interesting that uh, this point about the, the difference between the kind of quality and the content of the voice. But I think really most interestingly, it's fascinating from a point of view of the truth that there's this idea that the body sounds within us are somehow, for doctors anyway, more sincere than our spoken, than our spoken voices. Uh, that they're voices that don't lie and that can't deceive. So that perhaps to give a really truthful account of ourselves, we have to, uh, we can't always rely on our spoken voices. And that perhaps these body voices always offer us uh, a more authentic voice of, uh, of ourselves. And I think that in relation to this idea of silence, which is uh, the, uh, the right to silence uh, that we're talking about today, is that uh, it really, this kind of idea of auscultation and stethoscopic listening really reinforces that point that uh, there isn't a silent moment, there hasn't been a silent moment in the entirety of human history because there's always been the presence of this uh, bodily and embodied sound um, or this uh, embodied voice that we all possess. I'm going to stop there.